I've done a video like this in the past, but I feel like I didn't simplify a lot of the terminology enough and had too much of a competitive focus there. So this is my personal philosophy when it comes to approaching characters in this game. A bit separate from the way it's codified in professional gameplay, since most people will have a harder time understanding that. Oh my god. Anyway, why are you recording in your bathroom, Greg? It's because this video is sponsored by Manscaped, the global brand for men's hygiene and grooming products. We got everything offered in the Performance Package 4.0. I got a lot of really cool stuff to show you guys today. This is the lawn mower cordless trimmer, as well as crop preserver ball deodorant, crop reviver ball toner, and it also came with the weed whacker, the electric nose and ear hair trimmer, built off of the same skin safe technology that's proprietary to Manscaped built into the lawn mower. They're built with ceramic blades, as you can see here, and you can run them over water to clean them. The trimmer heads are super easy to put on. To clean it, you run it over with this brush, like that, and then you can run it under hot water. Bada bing, bada boom. Stands up out of the way with the rest of your hygiene products. Doesn't take up a lot of space. If you push the power button three times, one, two, three, look at the lights in the bottom. No buzzy. Right? It'll tell you, no, 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 I can't. No buzzy. Got to hit it three times again. One, two, three. Your uh, regions, your smelly regions, most of you guys know this stuff, but a lot of you game, so you do need to hear this. You got smelly regions here, and smelly regions on the front and back of, you know. So this, Crop Reviver, this is stuff that you can spray on anytime you want. Crop Preserver, this is stuff you put on after the shower. This stuff is gonna keep that area dry and it's gonna eliminate odor. For a limited time only, get all the products I just covered and the Shed Travel Bag, a dop kit for all of your on-the-go manly shaving needs, plus Manscaped branded anti-chafing boxer briefs. Break the gamer grooming stereotype by going to manscaped.com today and you'll get 20% off your order with free international shipping, plus the Shed Travel Bag and Manscaped boxer briefs when you use the code GREGOR at checkout. Thanks again to Manscaped for sponsoring this video. Manscaped. Always use the right tools for the right job. First of all, figuring out what operators to buy can be addressed by how much you are willing to invest in the game. I know that it's been out for a while, and it might seem a bit late to join the party and start learning. Siege has a substantial barrier of entry just in the knowledge department. So for the most part, this question gets distilled to, Should I buy Ace or Yana? And as much as I'd like to just say, Oh yeah, buy Ace. By Yana, I I'm sure it wouldn't matter to most, but this channel is about teaching Siege and I wanna give the most helpful information possible. So first of all, know how much you're willing to invest. If you just wanna pick a gun, go with the person with the better gun and just go with it, call it a day. Otherwise, this video is probably not for you. The conventional framework, however, that people apply to different roles in Rainbow Six Siege is entry frag, flex, and support. In the context of professional gaming, these labels are descriptive, but to the average person, I think they leave something to be desired. So I decided to apply my own framework to it instead. First of all, these are principles that apply to a lot of different competitive games, like Valorant. You want to think of different jobs in a competitive shooter like this on a spectrum from aggressive to passive sort of engagements with your gun. My concept for teaching this looks a little bit more like this. Out of your friends, which one are you? Drug free, crazy ass. Okay, but in all seriousness, here are my big three. The gunfighter, the specialist, and the bulwark. These characters are designed with a pretty simple core concept. If any of these players gets taken off of the board, how big of a loss is that to the team? How important is it that they stay alive? The gunfighter is a player who does exactly what the name entails. Gunfighters use their natural mechanical aiming talent to take the first heads-up gunfights for their team. Winning those engagements is crucial to their success as their ability to eliminate threats allows their teammates to take map control. Good examples of these kinds of characters are Ash and Zofia on attack, and Jaeger and Vigil on defense. The reason Ash is suited to taking the first heads up gunfights for her team is that her character design is deliberately made with no crucial gadgetry to open the wall or go for a site execute. She has no hard breach, no smokes or stuns. Her primary gadget basically consists of a gadget deletion device for things like bulletproof cameras. This doesn't make the gadget any more or less useful in the grand scheme of things, because without the ability to deal with that deployable shield, the gunfight becomes a lot more difficult to take. An ace may not be able to get that charge in the wall at all. Siege is a team-based game and everybody has to work together to accomplish a task. Everything has its place, and even Ash's Pro Pipe is no exception. A gunfighter on attack will place a pre-placed drone on a portion of map control that they want to obtain. Dry peeking is basically peeking without intel. 
Sometimes dry peeking is necessary when no options are available, but in the beginning of the round, this should not be happening, as you should have plenty of drone intel spread on the edges of the map. The defending player, a roamer, has to make this job as difficult as possible. Some game sense is required to know when to engage and when not to engage. But for the most part, the roamer's job is to waste time. Roam clearing is very important, because without it, the attackers will always have the threat of a potential flank disrupting their site execute. So, if the defending gunfighter can take an engagement and win, that's obviously helpful. But if they're clearly disadvantaged and have been droned out, they shouldn't take an unfair fight just because they have good aim. Gunfighters are a lot like a running back or a striker in football and... Football. They're responsible for forcefully taking control of the field and scoring points based off of their athleticism and quick thinking on the fly. The bulwark, comparatively, is a lot like your quarterback. I think Europeans know what a quarterback is, right? Basically, this player is usually the team captain, but there are exceptions to this rule, especially in professional play. For your purposes, it can help, though. The bulwark is usually what is called a support player. Examples of this include Thermite and Ace on attack, Maestro and Smoke on defense. This person has to have a decent amount of game knowledge from a top-down perspective, because without this, their drone play isn't going to be very helpful. Droning is important, but you gotta know what the drone, and you gotta know when to get on cams, too. You can think of the bulwark like a constant feed of information to your team. Without this guy's info, the rest of the team is in the dark. The bulwark can't justify taking heads-up gunfights at the start of the round, like the gunfighter, because if they go down, their gadgetry to open the wall with is gone. This is why they're usually assigned the diffuser, too, since they need to stay alive for as long as possible. The bulwark will get on drones at the start of the round for their gunfighters, and will do something called active droning, as opposed to pre-placed droning, where it's hidden in a more static position. Droning right in front of the gunfighter as they press their way forward into the map. If all goes well, eventually the bulwark will make their way to the wall, open it, and then ascertain whether or not it's safe to go for a diffuser plant. In a perfect world, they won't have to take any heads-up engagements, but sometimes they have to, out of necessity. A bad habit I see on defense, especially on ranked, is anchors, the defense equivalent of this job, just kind of sitting in a corner and doing nothing while they wait for the enemy to push for two minutes. This is a waste of time. The anchor on defense should at least get on cameras. They should be getting on spawn cameras and figure out where the enemy is as quickly as possible. If a camera in the south is shot right away, you know that the attackers spawn close to there. If it takes a bit of time for the other cameras to go down, you can probably assume they're stacked together. If multiple cameras get shot at the same time, then it could be more fanned out, like a split take. Angers need to get on cameras inside the building as well, so that their roamers can have an idea of what is going on at all times. Remember, you want to avoid as much guesswork in this game as possible. If you have a roamer on a staircase and the camera next to it gets shot from the kitchen hallway, that's valuable information they need to know. Finally, the specialist. The specialist is kind of a hybrid between the aggression philosophies of the gunfighter and the bulwark. Primarily because in order for them to accomplish their job, they kind of have to react to different situations on the fly. On attack, especially a common job for this player is flank watch. Nomad and Zero are great examples of this. Yeah, there's a frost there. Dead. Nice. On defense, somebody like Wamai or Azami kind of fits the bill. The specialist plugs holes in the team's gaps, usually with a particularly important job their gadget entails. Like I gave in the earlier consulate example, this can be accomplished by preventing flanks with Nomad's air jabs, waiting patiently for defenders that want to strike. The job is largely dependent on the gadget. For somebody like Dakebi, her job is instrumental for the roam clear, since you don't need to rely on drones as much. Lion's also a good example of this for similar reasons. A flex is expected to trade out their gunfighter in the event that they go down, and has to be able to switch back and forth between passive and aggressive play, depending on what's going on. This is part of the reason it's commonly referred to as a flex in competitive play, because that's literally what you gotta be. A specialist can play in a more aggressive roaming way to hold map control, or they can lurk a little bit closer to the site. For instance, Azami can do some very useful site setup at the start of the round, and comfortably play on the site, but she can also do that site setup and help with a top floor roam instead. I hope this video gives you an idea of what to look for in different operator types. Thanks so much for watching. Deuces.